Hello, and welcome to Bold Conversations, a five-part series on the Immune Deficiency Foundation podcast aimed at advancing knowledge and understanding of health equity. My name is Dr. Nicole Rochester, and I am IDF's Medical Advisor for Health Equity. I am a board-certified pediatrician who left an amazing career as a pediatric hospitalist, assistant professor, and medical director to launch my company, Your GPS Doc. If you're wondering why in the world I made that transition, the short version of the story is that I was transformed by a caregiving experience. While helping to care for my late father, I had to be a very powerful advocate. During that three-year journey, I discovered three hard truths. One, our healthcare system is incredibly and unnecessarily complicated. Two, our healthcare system reinforces behaviors and practices that erode empathy and disrupt the human connection. And three, your ability to effectively advocate for yourself or have others advocate on your behalf impacts the quality of care you receive. I believe that one of the key elements to achieving health equity is to empower individuals with the information, tools, and resources they need to partner with their healthcare providers in a way that reinforces their humanity and ensures they receive high quality care. In short, advocacy and health equity are like twin superpowers. So it's no surprise that IDEA with its 40 plus year history of advocating for those affected by primary immunodeficiency is also committed to this important goal. In this five part series, you will hear from me and other health equity experts as we explore the issues at the root of health disparities in the United States. But first, please allow me to set the stage. Health equity is not a new concept. In fact, health disparities have been formally documented for over three decades. In 1985, the landmark Heckler Report by the Department of Health and Human Services described an increased burden of death and illness among Blacks, Hispanics, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and those of Asian Pacific Islander heritage. Recommendations were issued across six categories with a qualifying statement that, quote, further improvements were urgently needed, end quote. In subsequent years, countless studies have been published documenting health inequities among minoritized racial and ethnic groups. In 2002, the Institute of Medicine released a 781-page report documenting that not only do marginalized groups have worse health outcomes, but they also receive lower quality care. Yet the pursuit of health equity has been largely ignored with little meaningful progress until now. So what shifted the tide? None of us will forget the spring of 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic and the murder of George Floyd presented a mirror that catapulted our nation into an unprecedented awareness of the pervasive atrocities of racism and bias. We discovered that the lives of black and brown people are not only threatened by overly aggressive and unlawful policing, but also by policies, practices, and behaviors within our healthcare facilities. In the last three years, health systems, payers, political leaders, advocacy organizations, and others have invested time, energy and financial resources to support the investigation and elimination of health disparities. There is a renewed and concerted focus on health equity and we can never return to business as usual. Let's start with the basics. Health disparities are defined as differences in the incidence, prevalence and outcomes of health conditions, diseases, and related complications among population groups. One example is the higher burden of diabetes and worse outcomes among people of color. 
Another example is the observation that Black women are three times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related complication than their white counterparts. It's important to note that in the United States, health disparities are most prevalent among individuals from racial and ethnic minority groups, particularly those who identify as Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, or American Indian Alaska Native. It's also important to understand that these differences in health have absolutely nothing to do with race. Race is a social, not a biological construct. 20 years ago, the Human Genome Project provided indisputable scientific evidence that humans are 99.9% .9 identical and that there is no genetic basis for race. In fact, there is more genetic variability among races than between them. We also see health disparities among other marginalized and underserved communities, including individuals with lower income and socioeconomic status, those who identify as members of the LGBTQ community, those with physical and cognitive disabilities, mental health disorders, and those living in rural areas. So now that we have a better understanding of what health disparities are and who is impacted, we're left with a big question. Why do health disparities exist? And an even bigger question, why do they persist in a country that spends over $4 trillion per year on healthcare? There is a growing recognition that health outcomes are impacted much more significantly by factors outside of the formal healthcare system. Health disparities are largely caused by social determinants or social drivers of health. These are the conditions in which people live, learn, work, and play, and includes things like access to quality education, reliable transportation, a living wage, healthy food, safe outdoor spaces, and appropriate health care. The primary reason health outcomes are worse among people of color is because of historical and contemporary barriers to these health defining factors due to structural racism. Marginalized communities are also subject to bias among providers, which is another contributor to health disparities. Against this backdrop, I'm sure you can appreciate the need to transform the healthcare system in a way that guarantees equitable outcomes for all people. This is the premise behind health equity, which is the idea that everyone has what they need to achieve their best health. I need to point out here that equity and equality are not the same. Equality means giving everyone the same thing. Equality is an espoused virtue in our country that's embedded in the founding documents of our nation, but one that has never been a reality. Equity acknowledges that the playing field is not level and that the only way to achieve optimal health outcomes is to give individuals and communities what they need. So let's talk about what health equity looks like in real life through a few examples. In the first example, let's think about patients with limited English proficiency, meaning English is not their primary language. These patients have a legal right to interpretation services in medical settings, but laws alone do not assure equity. As a physician, I can share with you that there are often challenges to accessing interpretation services and that doing so increases the duration of the visit. In a healthcare system that rewards efficiency and productivity, the need to provide interpretation services creates competing priorities. Unfortunately, when there are competing priorities in healthcare, the needs of our patients often suffer. Equity is not only providing interpretation services, but also building in additional time for medical appointments for these patients. In a second example, let's think about the social drivers of health I mentioned earlier. 
and the fact that individuals with low paying jobs typically live in underfunded and under-resourced neighborhoods, many of which have no grocery stores. Even if there is a grocery store, the cost of fresh fruits and vegetables is prohibitive for many. One strategy to promote health equity in this scenario is providing vouchers for free fresh fruits and vegetables to low-income individuals. In the last example, let's shift to primary immunodeficiency. It takes nine to 15 years to receive a PI diagnosis, and it is estimated that up to 90% of individuals with PI are undiagnosed. Given the barriers that exist for all PI patients, it is accurate to assume that racial and ethnic minority patients and those from marginalized communities face even greater barriers to diagnosis and appropriate treatment. A health equity approach involves investigating these barriers, partnering with stakeholders, and designing interventions uniquely designed to serve those communities. Stay tuned for more information in the months and years to come because there is exciting work happening behind the scenes at IDF in this capacity. The path to achieving health equity is long and largely unpaved. If I were to use a track and field analogy, it's like a hybrid between a marathon and a relay race. While we must champion the cause, we cannot become disheartened by what sometimes seems like slow progress. True change is achievable with organizational commitment, community investment, cross-sector collaboration, continuous measurement and improvement, and accountability for outcomes. I am thrilled to work with IDF on such an important mission, and I invite you to join us for future episodes of Bold Conversations as we continue to explore health equity and its relevance to the PI community.